using the Q&A function, not the chat function. And um, if you could, please indicate whether the question is for Torsten or for Keys. This is the 15th in a series of webinars that we've done on co-packaged optics and, and CPO, um, sponsored, uh, presented by Kobo, which is the uh, consortium for onboard optics, and uh, presented by DuPont Silicon Valley Technology Center. Um, we will have a replay of this webinar available in about a week, and the slide decks that you're about to see will also be shared online. So with that, let's get started. Uh, Torsten, welcome, and uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Jim. So let me just get this presentation started. Um, so I guess you can see the presentation now, yeah? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, yeah, as you uh, mentioned, uh, my name is Thorsten Fahrenkamp, uh, one of the uh, two founders of uh, FICONTECH. FICONTECH stands for Fiber Connecting Technology. That is what we do since uh, 23 years now. Um, we have started uh, 2000 uh, with uh, building the first uh, machines. We have 240 uh, people uh, working for us around the globe, and uh, we're working for the um, major uh, photonic companies in the world as a machine builder. As Jim mentioned, uh, I will uh, refer today the challenges and the strategies for high volume uh, manufacturing and testing of co package optics. And I will start uh, with a, a slide and a diagram we all know very, very well in different uh, forms, colors, uh, and magnitudes. It's um, the integrated photonic device forecast. Um, it's the, the integrated photonic uh, devices are mainly driven by uh, data centers today, but we see uh, new um, areas coming up. Um, just to emphasize that we are knowing, uh, or uh, Fagentech knows what we're talking about, approximately uh, 40 to 50 percent of all the devices which were assembled uh, or built in 2022 will uh, were coming from uh, one of our machines. So, um, and Today, um, these uh, are usually pluggable um, uh, components. Uh, we're assembling with our, our machines, a lot of uh, coherent um, uh, transceivers, but we see a drive into um, automatic assembly of uh, co-package optics. And this is um, why I found this topic today super interesting. And uh, I gave you, can you give you maybe a few insights uh, what we're doing currently? Um, if you, see the success story of uh, semiconductors, what happened over the last uh, 35, 40 years. Um, semiconductor became so successful because um, the device manufacturers um, started in the beginning of their um, uh, of the, the work in, in semiconductors to work very, very closely with the uh, machine manufacturers, the equipment manufacturers. And due to the fact that they Found a synergy and 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 a, um, an ecosystem of devices and machines. Um, a lot of standardization were possible. A lot of uh, processes were developed, which were really uh, conducive to high volume manufacturing. And this is something what we, as an industry, uh, the device makers, together with the equipment vendors, and we are for sure not the only one uh, uh, doing this. Um, uh, we have to, to generate um, a structure where we work together in order to, to follow the successor of semiconductors and turn that into the photonics uh, uh, as a, a photonics foot, uh, pass. So um, that's what we are working on. That's what we are a, uh, willing to, uh, what we're working on today with many large um, device manufacturers, with a lot of institutes around the world. And we are open to uh, cooperate with, with many other um, companies which are approaching us uh, to help them uh, to, to be in that, um, to, to uh, automate these kind of processes. Um, to make sure we all understand that packaging and the testing is still uh, a ma major cost driver in the, um, in the photonics uh, industry. And here's 
the industry always says it's 80%. I, I believe it's much less when it's coming to high volume or today's high volume manufacturing, um, but it's still like above 30%. Um, and this is something what we have to tackle as an industry. Um, and uh, that's what we are doing already. And I brought a few examples where, we, where we're working on high volume uh, manufacturing already. <clears throat> you see here, um, it's a air purity uh, sensor assemblies. Uh, uh, it's a complete line where you hear in the front, you put in the devices like housings, optical elements. And there are large feeders um, which put the optical components onto conveyors, which runs through the whole line here. And then you have, uh, in this case, three active alignment cells um, in the kind of buffer cell and an end of line testing until it here at the end will go out into blisters again. And then uh, the operator can take the components and bring them to the next process steps. It's a complete automatic line uh, for photonics. Here you see um, an installation in, uh, in Thailand where we have 150 machines, uh, cassette to cassette, um, located building transceiver uh, transceivers for one of our, our large customers. So there's one machine after the other. Um, they are all running fully automatic. The only thing you do is uh, bringing a cassette with uh, transceiver modules, and at the end you take this module out, uh, the cassette out, and bring it to the next uh, process steps. For example, a wire bundle. So high volume manufacturing in photonics is not new. It's done already. And um, for co-package optics, for sure, it's a it's a different uh, challenge because the, the components are completely uh, uh, different and uh, the way how the, the structure um, is, um, is made, the, the way how the machine has to operate in order to be able to also uh, bring a compact optic device uh, to high volume manufacturing is different. And it doesn't matter if the um, components are assembled actively or passive. I brought here, it's two examples you see here, it's a silicon chip, in this case with V-grooves, where the um, ribbon is put into the, uh, the V-grooves, or I use, uh, use lenses and I have a, a glass block and put the, um, the fiber array in front of it. So, but the way how the device is moving through such an automatic machine is different from what we are doing today. Um, we are preparing for that. Um, I just as an example, um, brought here the um, the passive attach of of uh, fiber arrays with a little um, uh, how call it a glass uh, piece which goes on top of the uh, the fibers. So you you have the V grooves here on the on the silic uh, on the silicon chip. You bring the fiber arrays in here. Um, you put the glass lid on top. You use uh, um, epoxy in, in different ways. Uh, and finally, you press the, the fibers into the V-grooves. That's today a very standard process. But if you want to go to high volume manufacturing, you need to deliver these fiber, fiber arrays to the, to the machine. And uh, one way, um, we are, uh, one um, uh, part of the process we are working on with different uh, customers at the moment is the full automatic fiber prep. Because somebody has to prepare the fiber or the fiber ribbon before it goes into this process. And here you see um, uh, a unit we have developed, a strip cleave uh, unit with a CO2 laser. So where you um, load the fiber from the spool you cut it to length with a um, uh, with a laser. You strip and cleave um, the the components. You insert the fibers into a connector or the the V grooves, and then you finish the whole um, uh, process with the with the um, uh, epoxy attach. If you have a glass block or a, 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 like an MT connector, you find finally need to polish. That's not done in the machine. That's an extra step. Um, I brought a video of this kind of uh, process just to show how this can uh, how this, how this will look like. So this is a, a buffer strip process with a CO2 laser. And finally, there's a cleave process. So this is the cutting of the fiber and cleaving process simultaneously. And this is the insert of the fiber arrays into the MT connector. And you can imagine this can be the same uh, can be also done within um, 
with a v-groove on the silicon photonic chip. So this is one of the examples where we work together with customers or on our own initiatives in order to prepare for co-package optics, because we think, um, we believe that the, the industry um, needs these kind of techniques um, because it's just the missing part of the whole process, putting the fiber arrays into the V-groups. So there's, there's many, many process steps like that. Since I only have 20 minutes, I will concentrate uh, on this one process because I would also like to um, uh, show um, the, that we have to have processes for testing. It's not assembly is only one part of the, uh, the whole equation, testing the optical components before they go into the packaging process and after they are coming out of the packaging process is essential. Um, we have started um, this activity in 2018 um, when the first wafers were brought to us and um, uh, people said, okay, we need automatic test equipment um, to test our wafers or singulated devices. And we worked, uh, and that time it was uh, still called Coherent Solution, today Quantify Photonics, and we built the first um, uh, test uh, uh, automatic tester, including instrumentation. In this case, the machine was the slave and the driving uh, unit, and I think Keith will uh, discuss that a little bit further. The the test instrumentation with their software was triggering our machine to go to the next um, to the next die. So, and we have evolved this technology now to a complete, full standardized wafer level test system, which you can literally buy off the shelf, and uh, it brings all the features in order to um, couple light into a chip, couple light out of the chip. Um, electrically uh, probe the device, uh, having RF um, uh, interconnects. We have uh, one tester currently in our facility, which has uh, over 600 um, DC and RF probes attached to the chip and uh, coupling light in and out of the chip. Um, there is uh, full data traceability in these machines where you can uh, finally get a complete mapping of your wafer. And I just want to show also a small video of uh, um, this kind of machine to see, to demonstrate how that is operating. And keys will come to the instrumentation in this presentation, but you load the, you load the wafer onto the uh, temperature control chuck. You can uh, temperature control these chucks from uh, minus 40 to plus 200 degrees C. You indicate the first or the, the three outer uh, points on the chuck. Uh, on the on the wafer to make sure the machine knows uh, where the devices are located roughly and then the machine moves automatically um, to the first chip you do electrical probing you move down uh, with the optical probes and you start your active alignment and you see here the top view uh, camera where we align now a singulated fiber this works the same way uh, with fiber arrays here you see a fiber array uh, just to show um, it can be one fiber array where it's in, in coupling, out coupling, or two fibers where one, one array is coupling in, the other coupling out. Very interestingly, um, we have um, developed with a partner company, Vanguard Automation, these periscopes. So these per periscopes are printed on top of a fiber array, which you see here. So these uh, little um, units here, they are 50 micrometer uh, tall. And with these units, you can actually move the fibers into a groove of a wafer uh, to do edge coupling in wafer level. It's a very interesting and very essential uh, part for a lot of our customers already. So here you see the, the 3D um, uh, or the, 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 the schematic, uh, how that works. You can adapt these lenses um, to the mode side of the, of the pick uh, you have on the wafer. But with this technology, you can move from um, device to device on the, on the wafer and do edge coupling. So here, uh, my last slide, we have uh, integrated this kind of technology, um, as I mentioned already, in our wafer level test system, um, where now you do characterization of the devices. So the instrumentation is triggering our machine to move from one device to the other. But you cannot do that only on wafer level. We have a lot of customers who do the same um, uh, the same tests on chip level. 
you see uh, a chip level approach where you have a um, the chip on the chuck also temperature controlled as i mentioned before um, the dc probes are um, uh, around the chip and then you have one fiber array to couple light into the chip and out of the chip and i have uh, here a picture of a tell uh, tester with the instrumentation on top this is going into the NAS testing, high, um, uh, high channel count uh, testing. And this kind of technology um, is mainly done right now with uh, for the, the um, electrical uh, or pure electrical testing, but it has to be done also for uh, the photonic uh, devices. So we're working with our partners on technologies to, uh, to tackle exactly that issue to make sure we have also mass testing capabilities uh, for wafers uh, in the future. Thank you very much. And I would like to give a hand over to Keith, who gives you a much, much uh, uh, closer view on all the requirements on instrumentation. Thank you. All right, let me share my presentation. Just one second. Let's see here. Okay, is it working for everybody? Yes, it is. And I'd just like to remind the audience, if they have any questions, please use the Q&A function and uh, we'll address them anonymously at the end of the uh, uh, case presentation. Okay, I have a hard time seeing my own slides. Uh, let's see, can you guys see my slides? Yes, uh, it's not in uh, presenter mode, but we see the slides. All right, <clears throat> here we go. All right, thank you very much, uh, Jim. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Kobo for, uh, for hosting this webinar and bringing together different kinds of technology partners to really advance the ecosystem. Of course, Copacus Optics, something really cool. You know, a lot of people, you know, wanna work with it, but still we are at the beginning stage and a lot of things need to happen to bring that to a, a mature level. I um, also wanted to th thank Torsten for the, for the excellent overview of photonics manufacturing and assembly equipment. It's pretty, pretty impressive um, what, what you showed there. So my focus is going to be on testing strategies to, to tie it all together, to go to the, you know, the, the, the final destination, which is commercially viable photonics technology or CPO technology in mass uh, volume. So, you know, everybody is, is pretty familiar with um, co-package optics, silicon photonics, um, <clears throat> as well as photonic integrated circuits. You know, the, the, the value proposition of these technologies is that you can really achieve the significant power reductions that are critical in next generation uh, networks, as well as the, the density and front panel bandwidth uh, that you also need in those applications. However, and I call this kind of the, the dark side of the moon, we typically don't pay so much attention to how we actually make these devices um, and also how we make sure that these devices are meeting the, the final specifications and requirements. So in order to do that, of course, you need to have the sophisticated and capable equipment that Torsten just talked about, but also you need to kind of have a holistic testing strategy to, uh, to make that happen. That will be the, the focus of my presentation. <clears throat> so just a quick market overview, where, where does photonics really play? So of course, hyperscale data centers, it seems that they're getting bigger and, and bigger. Um, you know, these are the, the data centers where thousands of storage devices, switches, and routers are, are all connected uh, and the distances are up to a few few kilometers. So obviously to enable that, those high-speed connections over you know, a few kilometers, you can only do that with <clears throat> photonics, optics. Um, and then also what we see is a trend towards 
improved um, compute networks for AI and machine learning, kind of disaggregated networks where you combine the uh, the compute functions on a single on a single board, but you connect those with uh, high bandwidth, low latency optical interconnects. Uh, of course, AI, machine learning, critical for our next generation infrastructure. So these are very big drivers for our uh, industry. If you look at the market size, you know I, I um, put some links to uh, market research reports of established firms. And if you look at the, um, you know, at the numbers, our job security is pretty much guaranteed for the next couple of years. But, but on a serious note, it really means that the pervasiveness of photonics in optical of, or in, uh, in computer and communication networks is really increasing significantly, which should lead to very healthy double digit growth for the foreseeable uh, future. <clears throat> so what, what is really now the problem statement? What, what, what is, what is the, the, the big challenge? What is causing the pain? Um, so Torsten already mentioned, also Jim, you know, we have this, this silicon photonics, photonic integrated circuit technology, which is kind of the basis for, for, for CPO. Um, you know, you have the production stages that you need to go through all with its specific test requirements. So first you get the wafer from the foundry, you know, you will need to, of course, do a wafer sort. What are the good wafers? <clears throat> or what are the good dye on the wafers that you're going to process to the next step? Uh, <clears throat> then you get the dye or the separate pick. Again, you need to handle those. So the, 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 the complex equipment that Torsten talked about can handle those dyes. You need, to, you need to test them. You need to align fiber arrays to the pick. Um, and then to, the, to do the active or, or, or passive alignment uh, and, and potentially add some additional chiplets on top of the pick <clears throat> to get to the optical subassembly. Um, then that subassembly will go to the, to the final stage, which is it will be incorporated into a package with even some additional equipments like electrical ICs to get you to the module level that will eventually go uh, to the end user. <clears throat> And then you also have the, the product life cycle. So you start typically in R&D where you get the first feedback on your design choices. So this is kind of the, I call it the expert phase where, where you know, very complex test equipment needs to give insight into your designs as quickly as possible to know whether you're going to meet the requirements. <clears throat> and then the validation states, it's really the, the design verification testing. You need to make sure that your product meets all the requirements over the intended operating conditions that it is going to see. Then the next step, okay, now you need to actually manufacture the product. Uh, of course, ideally you want to have the minimum testing in manufacturing, but you'll probably start with a kind of a, a pilot manufacturing line where you will do a little bit more testing initially as part of your learning curve. You, there may be a temperature screen still involved and then once you really have learned from that initial manufacturing stage, you're going to go to the next and the final stage, full volume manufacturing, and hopefully with a minimized screen of the device before it ships to the customer. <clears throat> and then you have the deployment phase where the module actually goes to the end user be, to be deployed in the system. Test requirements at that stage are again different. It's mostly like, hey, there is a, potential faulty unit. We need to test that, get a uh, quick pass fail test result, an incoming inspection of these valuable parts. Is it meeting the specification? Is it going to work? Or interoperability testing between different uh, brands of, uh, of modules. <clears throat> so th this is kind of the, the problem statement and this will define kind of the testing strategy that you will need to adopt to be successful and success is defined by commercially viable products in, uh, in, in volume. So <clears throat> in summary, so what is now really the, the requirements for the test solutions that are going to support um, these optical interconnects? Um, so the first thing is you need to be able to support the photonics IC testing from wafer to packets product. 
Um, again, it is different than the, the, the previous generation of optical transceivers, which had more discrete components that you need to assemble and align together. Very important, um, you know, the complexity of this technology really requires that you have a strong integration with the probing, assembly, and alignment, alignment equipment for these optimized test flows and uh, throughput. So then you need to have the ability to test these miniaturized high channel count devices cost effectively. And high channel count, you know, literally these are devices with hundreds of channels. That will give you some, some, some challenges that you need to think about in your strategy. And then there is going to be a variable mix of test parameters that you need to go through. You know, you, your product life cycle from R&D to manufacturing and beyond. There's a lot of things that you need to test. It's not going to be the same from R&D to manufacturing. That flexibility is really critical to be able to support that. And of course, last but not least, enable the manufacturing in high volumes, but do that in a very cost-effective manner. Typically what it means, you know, do more testing upfront, learn from that, minimize the testing in the later stages and optimize the test and manufacturing flow. So these are kind of, this is kind of setting the groundwork for what a testing strategy and solution needs to look like. So just a quick overview of what is, what is photonic testing? What are the things that, that, that people do? Uh, so you have the, the, the passive uh, testing, you know, basically you do a characterization of a passive waveguide structure that could be, you know, insertion loss, return loss, or polarization uh, dependence and, and wavelength dependence. Uh, you know, for instance, just a, uh, a passive demultiplexer, you can do a, a, a wavelength plot of, the, of that filter. Uh, an active test is now you look at the performance as a function of a, some kind of a control signal. Um, it could be um, a modulator, you look at the, the modulation depth, or it could be you, you turn on a laser, you're going to characterize the laser, you know, does it have the line, line width, side mode uh, suppression ratio that is required for the product. Then another category is at speed testing. So this is really the, uh, the, the, the high speed test, the driving your DUT with a high speed data generator. Uh, and you wanna see you know, what, is the, what is the quality of the transmitter? What is the quality of the receiver? An eye diagram, TDQ, uh, BER measurements or receiver sensitivity fall under that category. So these are very typical tests, but then very important are also environmental stress testing and highly accelerated lifetime testing. Obviously, these are you know, very densely packed modules carrying a lot of data. You want to make sure that you test, you know, like the environmental conditions, exposure to humidity, to temperature, uh, make sure that the reliability of the product is meeting the requirements. Um, that it needs to. Then last but not least, interoperability, you know, just testing the transmitter or independently the receiver is fine, but you typically want to do also do kind of a system and a link test. You plug it in the system, you let uh, modules from different vendors interoperate with each other over a variety of conditions to make sure that you have the, the full interoperability that is required for your, uh, for your system. So, I mean, it's kind of a, a, an elaborate uh, introduction, but it it's kind of sets the, 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 the stage for, uh, for some of the examples that we're going to uh, review here. So, so wafer level um, inspection and testing, uh, very important. Thorsten gave some, some excellent examples of it. Um, so it, again, this is part of the photonic integrated circuit <laughs> ecosystem. Um, you get away for, from the foundry, you need to characterize uh, that wafer. So you, it needs to, so the testing needs to be integrated with the, uh, the wafer handler, which is going to control, you know, the position on the, uh, on the wafer, as well as the probing. You need to, you know, get a signal, an optical signal into the wafer, and you need to get an optical signal out of it uh, to be able to performance characterize the wafer. So, you know, this is like a schematic on, on the right. So what you will see is um, the probe in, the probe out, you connect test equipment to that. And it can be a, a very wide variety of test equipment. So it really depends 
what you're going to test, um, you know, that will determine the selection of your test equipment. So it could be a fixed laser, it could be a swept laser if you want to do kind of a, a wavelength dependent uh, measurement. Uh, you can use an optical amplifier, make sure that the, the power level is meeting the requirements. Uh, it could be a polarization condition, very important. Uh, in a lot of situations, you cannot control the polarization. You need to make sure that your device is working over a variety of polarization states. Uh, on the other side, um, you're going to do some, some, some measurements. So it's an, an optical spectrum analyzer looking at the, you know, the optical spectrum out of your DUT uh, optical power detector. This can be used for alignment. It could be used for insertion loss, return loss measurements, just a signal or just a, a, a quality check of your, uh, your waveguide. Optical to electrical converter if you want to do some additional measurements in the electrical domain or an oscilloscope and clock recovery for the high-speed testing that we, uh, that we alluded to. So very complex testing, but the, the key is that the, the testing equipment is nicely integrated with the wafer handler and the, also the, uh, the probing system. Then the next level at the die and the pick, uh, of course, you know, the, one of the problem statements is we're, we're now going to have um, modules with hundreds of channels. So very important that every channel works. You, uh, you know, the, the feedback that we're getting from the industry is we really want to make sure that we test each and every channel. Um, you cannot have, of course, a module shipping where one or two channels are not working. So very critical. Um, in this stage, what you will do is you will, of course, do the uh, alignment of the fiber array. You can do it maybe in, in a passive way, as, as Torsten, men Torsten mentioned. But I see a lot of people still wanting to do kind of an, an, an active alignment. You look at the power levels, you optimize the position, then you, uh, um, then you basically can cure the adhesive to make sure that you have the optimum performance. And then it will also allow you to do a test of all channels as a performance verification. Yes, the device is, is working. Uh, it can go to the, to the next stage. So then the next stage would be <clears throat> kind of the, the module testing. So um, this is typically you know, the, the final stage. You combine everything together. You have your optical subassembly. You maybe have a PCB, some electrical ICs to, to give it the, the very the, the MSA defined form factor like the QSFP DD or, or the next generation OSFP XD or OIF 3.2T uh, CPO. So you typically need some kind of a fixture to get access to the DUT and uh, get access to the high speed signals. And, and, and especially in, in the early phases, you probably wanna do a kind of a, a thermal stress test as part of the, of, of the final stage. So there's going to be either a thermal stream or kind of a, a tech uh, for, for temperature control. So if you look at the setup here on, on the right, this setup will allow you to do, so it basically it has a fixture, it has a bird, it has some switches, it has some uh, test equipment on the sides to uh, enable you to do analysis of the optical spectrum to see whether your transmitter is working fine. You can do the at speed testing of the, of the eye diagram and TDQ with the DSO. And you can also do receiver sensitivity. You can send the signal back to the receiver, do a BER measurement, control the optical power level so that you can do your, your sensitivity measurement to make sure that it, it meets the requirements. Uh, in manufacturing, obviously, you, if you do this, this full characterization, it gives you the ability to do some additional tweaking of the device parameters to get your maximum yield. Uh, in, in, in pilot production, you're probably going to learn a lot so that in, in mass uh, production, you have to hopefully do a little bit less of the testing, but still there are going to be a few key tests that you need to do before you ship uh, the product to your end user. You know, a great example of, of CPO uh, module testing is this, uh, this slide here. Um, so we're working with an end user. They wanna test all channels of their DOT. It's a few hundred channels, uh, obviously, Doing that sequentially is, is just going to you know, kill the test time, it's going to kill the, the workflow. So we, just, we developed a module with 288 channels. It's a 19 inch uh, with one U high pizza box 
the 288 channels that enables the customer to do a, a parallel screen uh, to make sure that the product is meeting the requirements. So that's, that's pretty unique. And this is kind of really driving some of these, 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 these key requirements. You, know, you need to have this, this, this high density, you need to do the, the parallel testing of, of 100 channels to be able to do this commercially viable uh, technology. So talk a little bit about uh, CPO um, and, and, and you know and kind of the test strategy that you that you will need to plan for that. So of, of course you will go through the, um, the 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 product life cycle from R and D um, to manufacturing and deployment. You will have, you will have your wafer, die, assembly, and package products. A couple of things I, I think are really important here. You know for the initial phase uh, in R and D, you know you you you'll get a lot of test data. You want to circle that back to your design tools for the optimization of the designs, the, the ODVTs for the design verification testing. Uh, it, you will start expand very quickly, especially in the characterization validation state. Get a lot of data, understand your product, understand your process to optimize the test and workflow later on. Um, I, my background is telecom optics, so stress testing, reliability testing early in the process. It's really critical you know, to, to weed out potential failure modes and to really get you to that uh, you know, the technology, reliable technology um, that you wanna to bring to market. Um, again, in the early phases, take as much data as possible to learn from that. And in the later stages, focus on the critical parameters. Um, you know, but you typically see in, in the ecosystem that the developer really you know, works on the testing strategy in, in the earlier phases in very close cooperation, of course, with their partners, manufacturing partners, uh, the foundry, the OSET and the contract manufacturer. At the manufacturing stages, typically those manufacturing partners will own more of the testing strategy. And then the end user, once they have the product, of course, they are basically um, defining what kind of test requirements uh, there are. So a little bit more detail for, for the CPO, um, you know, the kind of, the, I call it the, the, the test life cycle is, you know, in the early phases, you know, do a lot of testing on your ring resonator. Um, is it meeting the requirements? Do you have the, the coupling efficiency, the, the, the bandwidth, the, the channel suppression, um, also the, the, the high speed modulator, you know, in the early phases, make sure that you test the bandwidth, the modulation depth, those are going to, those um, <clears throat> designs are going to determine the success of your products. So test that early, get the data, feed it back to your design tools and optimize it. <clears throat> then for instance, in, in the validation states, um, you get your wafer, you really wanna do a, a, a thorough investigation of what is the performance across the wafer. Do the dye have all the same behavior, other patterns, get a lot of data and try to figure out <clears throat> whether you can come up with very simple screening routines to, def to, to basically test and measure and know whether your dye is a good dye or not. So um, again, get, get a lot of data. Based on that, you will define a dye screening test. And hopefully that the more data you get, the more you know, you can simplify uh, that test. <clears throat> a couple of other things I think just looking at the time here, a little few minutes left. Um, also in, in the middle stages, the validation characterization states doesn't have to be maybe necessarily a package product. You can test the, the wavelength and polar, uh, polarization dependence of the photonic integrated circuit. You know, in a lot of cases, we cannot control the polarization of the light that goes into your, into your device. So you need to be basically wavelength or sorry, polarization insensitive and a lot of devices have a wavelength range over which they need to operate. So testing that your device is meeting the requirements over that specific wavelength range is really important. And there's a lot of test modules out there. Uh, you know, we have them in PXI format, uh, like an, an optical spectrum analyzer, uh, a tunable laser source, a polarization conditioner, and an array of photo detectors that will enable uh, that kind of testing. Um, once again, for the, for the package device, make sure that uh, you spend a lot of time on, on the link testing, the system testing, uh, transmitter receiver measurements are good, 
but really making sure that it actually works in the intended system environment. Can it communicate to you know, another module? Really, really important. Uh, and also, of course, making sure that you do the, the, the process voltage and temperature testing uh, of those modules to make sure that they're going to meet the requirements over the intended uh, range of, of operating conditions, but also over the process parameters that you uh, have defined. And, and last but not least, you know, in the manufacturing phase, of course, it's really, really important you know, that, that you know, a lot of the testing, the testing that you do in manufacturing has a very direct impact on the cost of your modules. You know, testing all channels is feedback that we get uh, you know, from a lot of participants in the market. So we, we enable the very densely integrated mass parallel testing that is required for that. And then for, for pilot production, you know, it's, it's good to, to get a little bit more data um, as part of the learning curve. Um, you know, so get all the test results, uh, make sure that you can do the, the, the optimization of the device uh, to maximize uh, your yield and spec compliance, maybe validate some of the spec compliance over temperature, and then use this information to say, okay, I really understand my product, my process much better right now for the, the final stage mass production. I can do kind of a limited uh, set of tests to really make sure that it's sufficient also to prove that the product is in spec before you ship it. So that brings me to uh, the conclusions. Um, I think the key is really that uh, what, what we believe is important that you have a testing infrastructure uh, with, with certain characteristics that can meet the requirements of the, the new integrated photonics uh, ecosystem. Um, the key is really to cooperate with partners. You know, Torsten mentioned that, um, and, and of course, Kobo is doing this as well, really inviting different kinds of technology partners to participate in these kind of events. Um, you know, this is, this, is, this is not an easy problem to solve. So cooperating with uh, the developers of optics, the equipment manufacturers, the service providers to help move the industry to the next level. Um, so the infrastructure needs to be flexible, different kinds of test modules, different kinds of form factors, because the mix is going to change throughout the product life cycle. Scalable, maybe in the initial phase, you test a few channels. There are a lot of stages where you need to test all the channels. So you need to be able to do multi-DUT, but for sure, multi-port testing of potentially hundreds of channels. Very important. High density, rack space is important. Uh, you know, we chose the PXI platform and also an additional custom platform that can really get you to these extremely dense test platforms uh, that you can then nicely integrate into, uh, you know, uh, for instance, a, uh, um, a photonics assembly uh, and test system. Um, and the size matters a lot because obviously, you know, you know size is, is kind of uh, is expensive. Uh, mixed signal, very important. You know, you have a mix of tests that you need to do. Being able to combine it with SMUs, uh, general spectrum analyzer, and, and the photonics test platform in the PXI uh, form factor is, is really important. It, ha it has kind of a nice triggering so that you can actually optimize the test and manufacturing flow, again, to drive this cost effectiveness. Uh, versatile, very wide selection of, of test functions are needed. You, you need to be able to support it for your optical test bands. And last but not least, you know, being able to easily integrate into um, a, a kind of a, a larger test platform, uh, or more importantly, kind of an assembly alignment um, and, and probing system. So having a, a common user interface, an easy defined API that, that can easily be used to integrate into a larger set of equipment like, like FICONTEX are really important requirements that you need to fulfill to be able to, to drive this technology uh, to the next level. So this kind of concludes my, uh, my, my presentation. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for your attention. And uh, we're all going to be at OSC and hopefully we'll, we can meet face-to-face uh, -face if you have any specific follow-up questions. Thank you. 
All right, thank you. Thank you, Case. Thank you, Torsten. Two excellent presentations, lots of interesting materials. And in case, as you said, this is not something easy. It's obviously a, a big technical challenge to do this. Um, so thank you again for sharing your insights. So we're gonna be going through the Q&A portion uh, now. I see a number of questions are coming in. As we get um, started, I will read through the questions anonymously, by the way, and we'll get through as many as we can. Case, could you, as we start this, could you maybe share your screen again? And I'd like to go back to slide number 10 and ask you, ask Torsten a question about that, actually. It's the, I think you were showing um, the, the density challenge there. And as we are looking ahead towards 51.2 terabit package switches, it's clear we're going to have hundreds, maybe even a thousand fibers coming in. So I'd like to get you know Torsten's perspective on that. Um, is that something that uh, we are, from from the manufacturing side, um, prepared to do? So the 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 larger um, uh, fiber arrays we have done so far, there are two hundred fifty six fibers. Um, we see that currently uh, more on the the quantum uh, uh, space rather than the the um, uh, telecom datacom uh, space, but in general, if, if it's becoming more than 250 uh, um, uh, fibers, uh, you finally get a problem with the with the accuracy of the outer fibers uh, being being aligned properly. Um, but it's a new challenge. I see. So our, our first question, um, in the same regard, um, for you, Torsten, two coupling architectures, Edge and VGroove, were mentioned. Are companies developing different proprietary systems, or is there any convergence towards standardization or a preferred solution? Um, so there, there's a lot of our customers or, or a lot of industry uh, approach um, to to go to to uh, to use vGrooves. Um, on our machines, we have nothing seen today which is in in a higher volume production. So. Um, there's a lot of attempts, um, and um, I think uh, sooner or later we will succeed to bring that into into high volume manufacturing. There's a few things um, which are proprietary, which I cannot mention how how exactly to do that, um, but um, uh, I'm, I'm sure we will see passive attach. But at the moment, everything is active. Okay, you also mentioned um, epoxy that, that these are bonded in in that way. Um, is that something that um, perhaps is changing as well? Do you see a you know, need for other types mm -hmm. of materials, um, so, especially um, temperature-wise? Um, the, the higher volume uh, devices, there are uh, uh, currently, um, if, if it's, um, th there is epoxy in, in, in one of the devices, either on the lens side or on the, on the fiber array side. Um, uh, if it goes into into space applications or into uh, cryogenic applications, then um, there's uh, laser soldering uh, techniques are used uh, used, but but not in the high volume uh, manufacturing we are doing with the machines. Okay, okay. Um, a second question for you, Torsten, regarding the photonic tester. How does the system communicate with the foundry MES, where the system works, or does the system work standalone? Um, no, so first of all, there's an, um, a TCP/IP uh, protocol between the test instrumentation and and the machine, um, which they use where the the test instrumentation is uh, triggering the machine or other way around. And then um, there are multiple uh, um, MES systems in the market, and uh, we have this is usually a custom interface uh, we are providing. Um, we have like done, I think, like four or five different uh, um, MEM, uh, MES uh, integrations now with the, with the tester, um, but this is usually custom. Okay. Kiza, I don't think you need to uh, share the slide anymore. Um, maybe we'll go back to a different one in a bit. Um, but this next question, I think, can go to uh, both uh, presenters, and it's about the yield rate. So how can we improve the first pass yield rate considering we have so many fibers and this higher level of complexity that's coming into the assembly process? How, how are we doing on yields overall? And do you see this improving? Torsten, maybe you want to take it first.
So do you mean uh, the, the yield improvement after the assembly process or on the chip level? Uh, I, I think after the assembly process in, in general. Um, the so the assembly process, the assembly process uh, itself is, is not, so as long as it's active, um, that is not where you lose your devices. Um, actually, we this, this machines and the the, um, the picture I've, uh, I've shown in the where the uh, the production uh, in Thailand. These machines are running on on ninety yeah close over ninety nine uh, percent uh, yield. So that is not necessary where you lose the lose the devices. There are other processes in the in the adjacent uh, and. Uh, that, that, the, that the laser integration of the um, of the chips are not not perfectly done. That uh, um, that other areas in the in the assembly process and also in the chip side, uh, which cause uh, yield drops. Okay, uh, Chase. How about from your perspective, where testing is being done? Obviously, that's where the you know it's good or it's bad, right? Uh, so yeah, well, that that's true, and and I, I think one of the the key keys for for, for doing a, a successful testing strategy is, is really try to you know gather as much information early in the process to really understand the product and the process how it behaves over certain conditions but once you have that information then you can just have very smart screening procedures so that, that you once you do test a a a, a chip or a um, a pick um in in the in the later stages of the production that you know that you have an effective screen. So getting a lot of data early on to really understand product and process will help you come up with the, the, the best screening parameters later in the process so that you will actually have a better yield as opposed to, you know, you do a screen, but you really did not did do the right kind of screening and you're still going to pass through devices that are not going to uh, meet the requirements. Mm, okay. And that of course impacts economics. Um, this next question, though, I think uh, goes back to Torsten again. What what are the DFT requirements which a photonic chip designer should follow to allow for optical coupling using prisms in the V grooves at the wafer level? Sorry, can you repeat that question? Yeah, that? so it's about the DFT requirements which a photonic chip designer should use. So when you're designing your photonic chip, what are those requirements if you're thinking or you're want to allow optical coupling using prisms in the v-grooves at the wafer level test oh um so yeah that is very uh um so in general we just need a 50 uh, 50 micron wide 50 micron deep uh, groove next to the chip to to bring the periscopes in and, uh, yeah I, I take it you are working with photonic chip designers on those kind of questions right so yeah, so in generally, uh, we adapt the, these little periscopes. Um, you, we are usually getting the, um, uh, the mode fields uh, from the chip, chip designers. And then they are, uh, they are, it's actually printed. So we keep these, these periscopes can be very easily adapted to any kind of mode field uh, and, and, uh, and, and requirements on the, on the chip side. Could you perhaps show that slide, Torsten, with the periscopes yeah, again? Uh, let me just uh, go. Back there. I wanted to ask also about those periscopes. Um, is that a proprietary technology or? or no, that is, uh, you can buy that. Uh, it's not an off the, off the shelf product, but you can buy that from, uh, from the company Vanguard Automation. Okay. And, and these are attached then with the V grooves? So it's actually uh, uh, this, this, this process is, is called uh, two photon polarization. Um, this we, we build is actually a part. So the <clears throat> the the boxes uh, um, uh, Vanguard is using um, they are actually built with uh, um, um, also by by Fikantech, So we have a close cooperation with them. And actually, it's a photon two photon polarization. So you actually you you put a glob top uh, of of uh, epoxy uh, a polymer onto the onto the fiber array, and then you with a with a femtosecond laser you are actually writing um the structure you're generating the structure and finally you 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 develop the resist and what's left over is these is this um is the structure of the periscope okay uh i i know we have more questions coming but um 
just wanted to ask what, what would be the advantages of using this this um, periscope idea, this prism in, in general? Um, it's very um, uh, so. The the prism usually needs a much larger real estate, or at least to my, my knowledge, a, a real estate on the wafer in order to be, be brought into the into the groove. Okay. Um, and these these uh, periscopes can be super tiny, as so like uh, small as as fifty microns. Okay. Interesting. Um, interesting. I'd like to learn more about that at some point. Um, we can have another chat. Let's keep moving on to some of the other questions. Um, I, Keys, I think this uh, next one would be for you. Any insight on how to improve the efficiency of optical active testing? 51.2T mentioned again, 400G FR4 as the example. That might require, what, 128 ports. Yeah, I mean that's uh, that's obviously going to be a little bit of a, of a challenge. I think some of the, the 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 key requirements that we talked about, you really need to have an answer for that. So for for those technologies with so many many channels, um, you know, you need to really look at how can I come up with a cost effective test strategy that makes sense. So uh, just just focusing on the capex for test equipment is is is, is important. Because, but but you really need to make sure that you that you select the equipment that is is good enough to do the test that has the feature set to do the testing. But really focusing on the operational expenditures of the of the test, making sure that you uh, optimize the, the 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 test flow. You know, working with a, a experienced partner like Ficontact to really understand like this is the flow that we're going to do. Um, you know, the manufacturing and test flow. To optimize that, so that you can really, you know, have an optimum throughput. Um, having fast test times is really important, so that you can really op optimize the overall flow. Uh, having the density, that extreme density of, mm -hmm. of test equipment, because that's that obviously for those kind of channels is going to be important. And also having solutions that allow you to do the testing of hundreds of channels in parallel is critical so that you can do this, this kind of cost effective testing. So, and, and of course the, the, the really the integration of the, of the testing as part of the, uh, the, uh, the, the manufacturing process. So all those parameters are really critical to deliver a test solution that can effectively, cost effectively test those next generation uh, CPO modules. Okay, and, and that comment about fast test times, why, why is that? So critical. These are high value parts. Um, so it's more. Well, yeah, that's 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 a great question. I mean, obviously, you, you need to look at the, the the overall, the bigger picture. What is your cost of test? And we're actually writing a, a white paper where we give some some guidance. You know, what what are the parameters that you need to focus on? I mean, if if you you need to be very critical about it. If you if you have a setup time that takes you fifteen minutes. Uh, they need to do a quick measurement. You know, it needs to be relatively fast to that. Uh, not not dramatically fast, relative, but but you know, if you do a setup time and then you need to do a quick measurement, that is really important. If you do a scan over a, a wafer, you know, you you cannot you know, you just you can just count it. Uh, if you have like thousands of cells that you need to test, test time for every cell is super critical. So having these fast test times. Having this test equipment that can give you results quickly will significantly impact your your cost strategy or your your testing strategy. Okay, all right, great. Well, we are at the top of the hour. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't been able to answer all of the questions. Many more excellent questions have come in. Uh, so, uh, I, I guess one final question for for both of you: Will you be at OFC? Yes. Yes. And uh, so for, for those who have questions, I, I, uh, I guess that will be an opportunity to meet in person and have them addressed directly. Um, will you be at the Kobo booth or will you be at your, at your own booth? Where, where can people find you? I'll let Torsten go first. No, you caught me by surprise. I don't have my booth number <laughs> with me. Uh, but but uh, we're in the, uh, the main hall, so uh, Ficontech. Um, we have a okay. pretty pretty large booth over there. In case, yeah, oh, we, we have a, we have a booth uh, there as well. I think it's four five one one. 
but uh, you know we have some also we have some presence at the at the Kobo boot to talk a little bit about you know kind of testing strategies for for CPO, um, and we have some we're at some other places as well. But uh, we'll definitely be uh, at OFC. Okay. Great. So now I got my boost number. It's uh, uh, four uh, seven two five. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. Well, um, the slides that were presented by by both Torsten and, and Kays are now available on the Kobo website on boardoptics.org for anybody who would uh, like to see them, share them with their colleagues. This whole webcast webinar will be available probably in about a week or so, and uh, we'll send out information on that. And you're welcome to share that with your colleagues for watching on demand. Um, please stop by and see our two presenters and the Kobo booth at uh, OFC. Um, I hope to answer any of those questions for you guys at that time. And with that, we'll, we'll wrap up our, our webinar for today. I'd also like to thank DuPont Silicon Valley for sponsoring and for hosting this webinar. And of course, Kobo, we uh, onboardoptics.org. So uh, thank you both and thank you to our audience and uh, hope to see you again next time. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.